So I'm out here to brainstorm tonight. I don't know if that will work. Feels like it's not ready yet. Maybe I'll talk about that. So I'm working on my big work in progress, which is a five book series. Actually, it's a serial that's going to be about five books long. I'm already about 500 words, 500,000 words into it. Um, starting to get to the point where the characters figured out what problem they need to resolve. And it's a doozy. Um, but they have a lot of tools at their disposal, a lot of resources. It's impossible, but not out of the question. That makes sense. Which is about where you want to be, I think, as a writer, if you're going to do... Yeah, if you're going to write a book that satisfies this inner part of you that, that, uh, huh, maybe I should explain that too. Okay. <laughs> ah. All right. So a lot of people will plot their books out. They will figure out a good plotting system and they will set up their characters and they will say, these are the scenes that I want and this is how I'm going to connect them together. And every scene has a focus and a purpose and a, a reason. And you know, it works for them. It doesn't work for me. I crave a particular thing in a book and I, I don't know if I crave this as a reader but I definitely crave it as a writer and the thing that I crave is um, a sense that I have solved an impossible problem and not only that I have not just solved it but I have solved it in a way that could not possibly be solved by any other writer at any other time um, or in any other circumstances. Only the person that I am at that moment can solve the story that way. It's not predictable. Um, it's very delicate because it's me. Uh, it, delicacy often looks pretty gory and, and <laughs> people get eaten. Uh, there's, there's blood and guts everywhere. I don't know. Um, writing this book it's not a horror so I'm not entirely sure how this is going to go but there's a kind of moment that I'm always searching for and it's I solved the thing that wasn't supposed to be solvable not necessarily a puzzle requiring intelligence not necessarily a relationship requiring emotion not even necessarily some sort of like giant doom that needs to come down and smash the unjust although that's pretty dang satisfying I don't know how to really explain it. Anyway, I'm looking for that spot again. And this is where things usually get horribly torturous for me. In a story, I'm at about the two-thirds mark. Not quite closing in on the end yet. That'll be worse. But I usually have a, a bump right about here um, where I go, wow, this looks impossible. And I think I'm not quite at that bump yet because I still think I can solve it. So obviously I've not thrown enough obstacles in my way as a writer and something else has to go wrong. That's just, it's just me. If I feel like, <laughs> if I feel like the character, characters can solve things logically and I have not done my job, I have to, I have to be able to break the characters, break the situation, break everybody involved and put them back together in a different way. Otherwise, the story just doesn't do it for me. Um, the where sometimes that gets to be annoying, I think, is that I will hit that point and feel like the story is done. I'll tie off the loose endings. I'll tell you how everything's going to go. I'll be like, hey, here's your happily ever after or your terribly after, after ever after, whichever applies. Here's some irony. Yep, we're good. And people will be like, but where's the big battle scene? <laughs> like, they didn't need one. <laughs> They solved the impossible. Isn't that good enough for you? But for some people, it's not. That's not what they're reading for. That's okay. I'm just going to let that be. They can they they can find plenty of stories to satisfy them. They just probably won't happen to be mine. I know there's a particularly weird thing that needs to go down somewhere in this series. Because I won't be able to tie off a particularly big subplot without it. I thought it was coming up next. It is not. My subconscious is like, no, 
We're not even going to start thinking about that yet. So I'm not sure what to do. The character who is in charge of resolving the main plot. Uh, he's got a solution. It's a perfectly good solution. I'm like, yep, that would do it. And he thinks it out loud to himself. Says, yep, that's what I'm going to do. And so uh, my reaction is to go, fuck. Because I haven't found that spot yet. The place where everything goes weird. Oh, there's a poor baby crying head off. Back on the street out there. Poor, poor thing. Oh. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what to do. It's the end of that character's chapter. I need to switch to a different character. This other character, of course, has no idea what's going on because she isn't in the first character's head. He would have to tell her what he's planning. He probably won't because that's the kind of guy he is. Uh, Mm, nope, he's gonna. He has to tell her because that's part of the rules of this particular story is the characters, the main characters have to trust each other. So he, she's gonna find out here soon anyway what the plan is. So I can't just have him and her actually accidentally at odds or anything. That's just not gonna work. Bit. Anyway, I am searching for. Hmm. I'm searching for good stuff. The story means a lot to me. Um, I feel like I, I keep calling it my therapy book. It's actually a therapy series, you know, because one book just isn't enough therapy to, to get me through my shit. Uh, anyway, my therapy book, and it really has been. It's taken me from <laughs> being a wrecked uh, escapee from a bad marriage uh, to being somebody who's halfway is independent and like possibly has a writing career ahead of her. It's weird. I, I feel very confident in this book. Like it's not going to resolve everything for me, but it's probably going to be bigger than anything else I've done. Um, I hope it's a game changer. I just have to figure out how to sell it now. Here, read this book. It'll change your life. Um, but part of the thing that makes the book so wonky is that it, it got political really, really fast. I was not expecting it to go as hard as it did or to go as, as political as early as it did. Um, but it did. And so time and time again, um, the the province, province, the subject material of the book has changed on me, um, becoming darker, which I like, uh, more contemporary, more relevant, which is okay. Also kind of weird because you're like, hmm, this, this could go badly. Uh, but I'm also trying to resolve things that are impossible socially. Not just for the characters, but for the wider world. And I feel like it's kind of arrogant to go, oh yeah, I got I got particular special insight into here's here's how we should fix things. But like my characters kind of do. They don't have the answers. They just have a bunch of tools at their disposal and a bad situation that they have to resolve. And the situation they have to resolve is very much like the situation that we have to deal with at large. And I'm trying to figure out how not to betray the larger situation in how I write the story. Um, one of the things that I'm, I've been digging into lately for the story is um, on a personal level, on a, on a people by people level, not on a social level. I guess it is kind of a social level, but it feels like a personal level. Um, I don't think the way we do families works. I just fundamentally think it's it's not right. Like, the family units we have now are supposed to be hot swappable. Um, pop one family out, pop another one in. 
and there will be no disruption to the community or the business or the neighborhood or whatever. It's just supposed to work like that. And it doesn't. Um, a friend of mine posted a comment today that sent me down a rabbit hole on family therapy systems or something like that, which I don't know much about, but it was all very creepy. Like, I, the more you looked at it, the more it was a system for trying to keep a family unit together that really shouldn't necessarily be together. And I, I can only think like, of, I can only compare it to my nuclear family of birth and how messed up that is. <laughs> and, and like, I'm, I'm sure they think they're fine. But, you know, it's messed up. The whole situation is messed up. And then I think about my extended family, and it's worse. Oh, my God. My, my nuclear family is an island of sanity in a, a sea of crazy. I, I can only think that sometimes. Um, and it's still messed up. The whole thing is messed up. So how, if, if the individual family unit's not working, and I don't think it is, and the greater extended families when people have them at all aren't working and honestly some of the stories that I've heard from my daughter from other people's kids about how LGBTQ type found families are working at a younger age they're really unhealthy too like that like they're messed up too which is sad like you should be able to choose family and have them be good but it's really hard to create a group without coping with assholes um, a business a family any kind of government system anything that doesn't set out with an, a a basic understanding of what an asshole is and how to keep them from screwing everybody else over it's not going to work. It's, it's going to eventually collapse. That's just how it goes. Like, <laughs> there's a reason that the, the, like, usual time of collapse for a system of government is like 200 years or so. Uh, it just, eventually, enough assholes acquire power and they don't have the capacity to be wise because they're assholes. And so they wreck everything on purpose to take advantage of everyone else because they think that will help them. Instead of building up uh, systems that benefit everyone and benefit themselves even more than they benefit everybody else, they set up systems that only benefit themselves at the expense of everyone else. And so instead of a rising tide floating all boats, that sort of hypothetical situation, it, it ends up being a, a falling tide burns the city down and gets everybody's heads cut off in the guillotine. Um, and that's, <laughs> that's what this book is about. This story is about the series is about, uh, I guess that's what I, all my books are about this, how, how to deal with assholes. Um, but this one seems particularly apt where I'm, because it's so grounded in reality. There's no fantasy elements. There's no supernatural horror. You know, there's no, well, Okay. They're serial killers. Never mind. Um, it's but it's there are no supernatural elements, and it's on a plausible Earth that resembles our own, more or less. Um, there are some technological differences, but they're mostly just to make things less than they are today. Like I, I kind of secretly designed the crypto system to be awkward, so that if somebody tried to copy the plot twists in the book in real life they couldn't do it <laughs> so yeah I was, I, I was a responsible adult with um <laughs> I was more responsible adult with crypto than the actual crypto crypto people are with crypto um anyway I'm still I'm still processing how how to deal with assholes how to identify them how to accommodate them is the wrong word um, you can't get rid of them. If you, you manage to assassinate every asshole in existence today, they would still be born. That's just how our, our 
body's work, I guess, our genome works, something like that. Like, you're going to get a, a bunch of random ass shit and some of it's going to be uh, predatory, self-predatory on the species because we are both a competitive and cooperative species. Where you're, you're going to end up with people who are way too cooperative for their own good and way too, people who are way too competitive for their own good. And neither of those, those extremes are particularly wise. Uh, and so you don't want them in charge, but they're always going to crop up. There's always going to be some sort of aberration. Um, and in fact, it's better that they do. It's better that there's a wide variety of types of people born so that, you know, the species continues in its variety because there's got to be a niche for some of us little cockroaches running around, right? But the crux of it is how do I write this story to solve the impossible problem of the existence of assholes? I probably won't get it this time. I haven't gotten it before. I get a little bit closer or explore a different little spot, kind of, in all my big stories. The smaller stories, sometimes they don't stretch too hard. Like they're just there for a moment. They're to, there to entertain on a smaller level. You don't need to get too deep with a lot of short stories. Um, but... In a longer work, you kind of have more room to spread out, lay out all your ideas, and calculate them out through characters and scenarios, and go like, "Would it work like this? Would it? Work? What would this happen?" And on the one hand, I know I have all of, of the tools in place that I know of as a person, and I have all the threats that I know of as a person on the other and I'm trying to find that narrow wedge that narrow place in between all of the threats where I can find some tool or some combination of tools to get through it without hmm without scraping the reader down, wearing them out, putting them off, exhausting them, making them feel hopeless uh, at how difficult it's going to be. It has to be a smooth solution that feels both plausible and implausible, I think. Like uh, Princess Bride. There's no way they should be able to beat the ruler of a country, right? There's no way. And yet they do, and you buy it, but you also kind of know that it doesn't work like that. That it's kind of a fantasy, right? It's not just a fantasy of place. It's not just a fantasy of uh, character tropes or anything like that. It's also a fantasy of how the small can defeat the strong. And I need to find a place that's like that but not a fantasy. Hmm. I'm not really sure how that's going to work. <sighs> but the cool thing about it is I didn't have to plot this all out. <laughs> God, if I had to plot this all out, I would have died. I would never have gotten anything written. Every, every, I don't know if it's every word, but every little bit that I move forward on this book, I am kind of running a story program. Inside my head, I have a copy of Story with a capital S. Uh, and I don't know if I've talked about this on videos before. I've talked about it to people, but I don't know if I've ever written it down or recorded it. I have a copy of Story. I have a copy inside of me of what it means to write a story. Um, the differences between narrative and reality. I have this thing inside me that can create characters and give them life. I can... Uh, bring settings to life. I can do plot twists. I can, I can hold the thread from beginning to end of a story, and not drop it. 
I can also drop it, but I cannot drop it if I try real hard. I have the copy of this thing. Um, when you see someone and you're like, oh my gosh, they're such a great musician. They're natural. They're not a natural. They had to learn how to play music, right? They have a copy of capital M music in them so that they've internalized everything about music so deeply that all the pieces are kind of connected together on a deep level. They're never going to run out of things to learn, but they're a consummate musician. Um, everything they do is influenced by music and everything that they are influences the music that they make. Uh, like you hear Janis Joplin singing, there is no one else like Janis Joplin, right? There never will be, there never was, there's her and that's it. She was a consummate musician. She had a copy of music. Um, I have a copy of story. It's not entirely complete, but this stuff is kind of holographic where the little bits and bobs that you learn as you go kind of accumulate. Once you have the copy put together, it doesn't go away unless you get like brain damage or something, but uh, you have it, you can get a better copy. Uh, you're constantly rewriting it and improving it and changing it and tossing it out and starting over. You can't help it. It grows back. Once you have a copy of something like this, it's weird. Um, I think every discipline has this. Once you get past a certain point, you have a copy of whatever that is, like uh, a consummate chef, um, uh, the person who can cook without ever, they can, they can go like, oh, this dish, I've tasted it once in my life and now I can make it, you know, almost exactly the same way, but the person who made it originally wouldn't make it exactly the same way twice anyway, either. So I'm going to make it my way. It's mine now. Uh, you know, they, they're just, there's, it's really cool. It's fun being a professional. Anyway, um, so I have a copy of Story, capital S, and I don't have to plot anymore. I don't have to sit down and do that ahead of time. I've written, I think it's like 80 books now. I still haven't published 80 books because I've still, these four books that I've got so far since the last time I toted up the numbers, they're not published yet. Plus I've got this one to finish and then another one. So it's probably 80 books by now. Anyway, uh, I've written a ton of, I've written a shit ton of books for like ghostwriting clients and whatnot. Um, and I have a copy of story with capital S and every day I run into some more stuff that I have to add to it and take out and rearrange and change my assumptions on and rethink. It's an ongoing process. It's not to say like I have a perfect sense of story or anything, but I have a sense of story. And uh, every little bit that I move forward on this story, I run it through story with a capital S, that awareness, that program, it spits out information for me. I write it down. You know, uh, the characters do things. The characters say things. They are places that exist that I've set up. Um, stuff comes to life. And as soon as I get done writing it, writing it down, I feed that back into story with a capital S and it gives me more stuff. Uh, the process is much less linear than that. It's ongoing. Um, people will say shit to me and it'll pop up in my damn story like a page and a half later. Um, everything that I think about goes into it. Uh, if I eat something, if I feel like eating something, if I want to eat something because I love food, it will show up in the story sooner or later. Or if something shows up in the story, I'll have to go out and eat it. Um, I'll have to learn things that I don't want to learn <laughs> because I've written them a goddamn story. Um, the The reason that I actually like beer is I wrote a story and the, the, the main character was a, a brewer and a, a bartender and uh, a bar owner, sorry, barkeep. So I had to go out and I'm like, he likes beer, therefore I like beer. And I there wasn't a learning curve. I just, I had a beer and I was like, oh yeah, I like beer now. Great. Well, that's new. Um, they're just 
weird shit happens. You throw it in the story, and the story throws stuff inside of you. It's it's in a permeable boundary. Um, very cool, but you kind of have to give yourself over to it. I think. Hmm. Hmm. I think if I have something valuable to say, beyond oh god, I'm stuck on my story, and I need to figure out how to feed what I've got now back into the process of story with a capital S, and just trust whatever comes out. Whoa. It's that, that's the process. At some level, you get, you kind of have to, you don't get to, you kind of have to let go of the reins and not do what you're supposed to do anymore because the rules are blunt weapons. Um, the things that you're supposed to do in a story, the, the best practices, they are tools for babies. They're tools for new writers. They're tools for people who write maybe 10 books. Um, they are, they are crutches. They are props. They are a pre-built staircase, but stories aren't there for that. They aren't there for readers to climb. Stories are there to tell us that the impossible things can happen, that there is a path through many, many, many difficulties, even if sometimes that path is just grief. Um, even if that, the, the way the path through a situation is failure, sometimes that's what you have to hear. Stories, if they're doing their job, help us be human and not be assholes. They help us, they help drag the people over the line from asshole to human that were kind of born on the boundary. They warn us about the people who are never going to cross over. Um, they tell us how to maintain our humanity and not just turn it off. They help us find joy. They help us pass the time when we're suffering so badly that if, if we didn't have stories, we would burn ourselves out and our, our spark would die. 